The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy and Jason Link in studio. As always, thank you for joining us. We have a great show for you today. In just a few moments, we'll be joined by Chris Monaco, head of ISC ETF Ventures. And I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. Chris is involved in helping bring new ETFs to market. ISE was behind one of the most successful launches in ETF history, the Pure Funds ISE Cybersecurity ETF. And ISE currently has over 30 proprietary indexes with some 20 exchange traded products tracking those indexes. So Chris really has a front row seat to the innovation occurring in ETFs. Again, I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. We obviously talk a lot on this show about the finished ETF products, but we haven't spent quite as much time talking about how these products come to be, how the sausage is made, so to speak. So we're going to cover that with Chris. Again, he'll join us in about 10 minutes. Now, later in the show, we will try to squeeze in a quick market update. We'll talk oil. And then we'll also spotlight the First Trust ISE Cloud Computing ETF. This tracks an ISE index and covers an interesting slice of the tech sector. Uh, as always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFstore.com. You can find us on Twitter, or you can email us at advice at ETFstore.com. Uh, and I want to mention that we've added a, a neat new feature at ETFstore.com where you can voice your question and then we can play it and answer it on the show. You might check this out if you have a question for us. Just go to ETFstore.com and click on the Ask the Host button. So, Jason, what we're really going to focus on today with ISE's Chris Monaco is ETF innovation. ISE has been directly involved in a number of unique ETF launches, everything from the Pure Funds Drone Economy Strategy ETF, ticker iFly, uh, which is a great ticker, by the way. Of course, this ETF covers the drone sector, so we're talking about the little unmanned flying vehicles. Uh, ISC has been involved with the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF. Ticker ITEQ. This focuses on the thriving Israeli tech sector. IC has been involved with the Loan Car Cancer Immunotherapy ETF, which we spotlighted on the show uh, just a month or so ago. And we always talk about just how remarkable it is that investors can now buy ETFs that cover darn near everything. Uh, here we're talking about drones and Israeli technology and companies involved in cancer immunotherapy. Uh, but if we just think more broadly, uh, there are, are uh, of course, ETFs that hedge currency exposure. Uh, there are ETF selecting holdings based on all sorts of different factors, whether it be value, momentum, low volatility. There are hedge fund replication ETFs. You can invest in oil and gold through ETFs. The list goes on and on. But this is the innovation we're talking about. Investors can now access investments and strategies that simply weren't available in some cases even a year ago. Uh, think about last week. We spotlighted the Tierra Latin America real estate ETF. This offers exposure to real estate companies in places like Mexico and, and Brazil. And sometimes I think we toss around this word innovation, but we don't step back and perhaps marvel enough at what investors now have access to. The investment experience has changed dramatically for people. And, you know, sometimes I think we take that for granted. I think we do, Nate. You know, last week when we were brainstorming about this topic, it, I think it really did come to a point that we spent a lot of time talking about the existing product lineup out there in the marketplace. But it, it's an interesting story. How does a good idea become an ETF? How does an investment concept make it from just a thought in someone's mind to an actual product that trades. And it comes back to the people in this industry. They're just remarkable. And I'm literally looking forward to our discussion here in a moment. But the intellectual horsepower 
in this ETF space is really something interesting. It seems like when we review these ETFs, it seems like people are trying to do the right thing and bring new ideas and opportunities to the table. I also think one of the underappreciated aspects of this ETF development and launch process is that when something new comes around, it forces existing participants to examine their own cost structure. Great point. And, and so everybody wins. So it's, it's, it's hyper competitive and the end investor really is the winner. There is so much innovation going on. I was just reading this morning, you know, in the transportation industry, you know, Uber and Lyft and others. And, and will we need to own a car or will there be car sharing and car sharing ownership in the future? And, and Interestingly enough, talk about the fast pace of innovation. Uber and Lyft and these car service companies have only been around, what, a couple of years, but yet there's an iteration off of those, an Uber for women. You know, I visit with my wife and I say, have you ever used this? She goes, well, not when I'm alone. And I get that. Getting into a stranger's car, you know, that can be intimidating. But what about an Uber service where the driver's a woman for only women passengers? I mean, that kind of innovation, that's just a sliver of what's going on. So this is fantastic. Well, yeah, and people have compared Uber and ETFs, and, you know, I think that's a good analogy. We've also used the analogy of ETFs being like iTunes in mutual funds like the uh, the old cassette tapes or 8-tracks. But the bottom line is the game is changing. Uh, and, you know, putting aside this innovative aspect of ETFs, we talked last week about the new Department of Labor fiduciary rule which will require all advisors to put their clients' interests uh, ahead of their own when providing investment advice on retirement accounts. Believe it or not, that previously wasn't required of brokers. But we explained how ETFs stand to benefit from this, because if you have an advisor who is now legally required to look out for your best interests, it seems logical to assume they're going to gravitate towards lower-cost investments, index-based investments, where you don't have that risk of significant manager underperformance, uh, more transparent investments. And ETFs can check the box on all of these things. Uh, as a matter of fact, I came across a quote from FactSet's Dave Nadig, uh, who we've had on the program before. He wrote a great piece at ETF.com where he said ETFs are one of the winners of the new DOL rule. He said they are often the cheapest, most tax efficient, most flexible way to get exposure to an asset class as more and more advisors are forced to act legally and defensively in court in their clients' best interests. They'll naturally gravitate towards ETFs. And Jason, my point in bringing this up after we were just talking about uh, ETF innovation is, you know, I find it ironic. I find it exciting. I find it rewarding. There are a lot of emotions I have that the DOL rule is going to force advisors to use an innovative product that might be better for their clients. Boy, what a novel idea. Not only are ETFs generally cheaper, more tax efficient, more transparent, but guess what? You can also invest in darn near anything. Yeah, gosh, you know, twist my arm behind my back to use an innovative, transparent, low-cost investment product for my clients. Wow. Um, Good for the DOL on that one. But I I think we need to politely slap on the behind two different groups of people as this ruling comes about. And the first group are, is, is our industry, Nate, the, the advisor community. You know, this should be forefront for us. We should always have our clients' interests in front. And it just, as you, if that is your standard, that's the bar you must jump over. You're right in that what's, what's the logical product that checks all the box off from a compliance standpoint? And it is an exchange-traded product. But I also want to remind the individual investor, you know, the Department of Labor ruling doesn't just Apply, it applies to investment advisors who advise where their clients' money. But individual investors, if you're not taking advantage, if you're not taking the cue from the Department of Labor to say you ought to be using products with these kind of attributes, you know, it's time to take a look. So it, 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 we see that in the data because as fast as the exchange-traded fund space has grown at the expense of other areas – the adoption rate for individual investors is still slower or lower than it has been for the investment advisor community. So we know there's opportunity for individual investors to look across the landscape, including this new ruling, and and take advantage of some of these things. Well, we always like to say that ETFs have democratized investing. They've taken investments and strategies that used to only be available to wealthy and sophisticated investors and made them available to everyone. And I think between the innovation And the DOL ruling and investors as a whole just becoming more aware of the importance of things like investment costs and tax efficiency and transparency. It's the perfect uh, perfect storm for future ETF growth and even more innovation. And, you know, we need to take a break here, but I wanted to provide a a few brief ETF stats. You mentioned some ETF data uh, earlier, Jason. Listen to these. At the end of March, 
money invested in ETFs hit an all-time record high, nearly $2.2 trillion. That according to ETF GI. There are now 1,863 exchange-traded products available. In 2002, there were less than 130. Uh, and as we talk about innovation and this DOL ruling, I saw a great tweet from Eric Balcunas last week. He's senior ETF analyst over at Bloomberg. We had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. He referenced Goldman Sachs, okay, Goldman Sachs saying that the DOL rule will lead to ETF assets growing to $7 trillion by 2020. Now, 2020 is not some long ways out in the future. We're talking four years going from a little over $2 trillion to $7 trillion. Just remarkable. I mean, Nate, I know you like to throw out numbers, but just look at that trend line. That's amazing. Four years to see that. You know, this is in a world where, you know, homeowners expect to have a 15 or 30 year mortgage. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have a baby this year, you have 18 years to prepare for a college education and the costs of it. You know, the average car loan is four or five years. It's it's remarkable that the trajectory of this kind of growth of what they're what they're projecting. Um, You know, what we're seeing is transformational for those who want to get on board, Nate. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Chris Monaco, head of ISE ETF Ventures. We're going to help you better understand how a new ETF comes to market, and we'll talk ETF innovation in general. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837 or visit ETFstore.com. Business disputes are rarely just about money. Oftentimes, they involve a breach of trust or a fundamental disagreement about the terms or operation of the business. The law firm of Graves Garrett offers comprehensive and creative solutions to these types of complex legal problems. Graves Garrett represents businesses and individuals nationwide in commercial litigation, white-collar criminal defense litigation, and compliance and internal investigations. If you're involved in a critical legal dispute, let Graves Garrett be your voice. Visit GravesGarrett.com or call 816-256-3181. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own, human, who you are, and intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life, architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. We're always on the hunt for game changers. The iPhone, Uber, Airbnb, all revolutionary market leaders. In the financial world, the exchange-traded fund is the game changer, growing at a record pace by cutting the cost of mutual funds and helping you keep what you've worked so hard to earn. At the ETF Store, we utilize the latest technology to help you create a balanced portfolio you can monitor and, most importantly, understand. Call us today for a free consultation, 816-363-ETFS, or go to ETFstore.com. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapists, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at MyMassageBliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. For many, owning a home is the American dream. And at Stonegate Mortgage, we play an important role in helping you achieve that dream. So whether you're buying a new home or refinancing your existing one, choose a company that puts a face and a firm handshake behind every deal. The American dream lives on at Stonegate Mortgage. Call Tim Noyce, 913-717-4111. Stonegate Mortgage Corporation, NMLS number 186732. Tim Noyce, NMLS number 415086. Stonegate Mortgage is not licensed to originate loans in Hawaii and New York. Equal housing lender. 
Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese & Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy along with Jason Lake in studio. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Chris Monaco, head of ISC ETF Ventures. ISC sits in a unique position. They partner with ETF providers on everything from creating the index an ETF might track to providing funding for new ETFs and even marketing support. And ISC is behind a number of popular ETFs, perhaps most notably the Pure Funds ISE Cybersecurity ETF, which had one of the most successful launches in ETF history. They've also provided support in a variety of ways to ETFs like the Alpha Clone Alternative Alpha ETF, the Lone Car Cancer Immunotherapy ETF, and an ETF we spotlighted just last week, the Tierra XP Latin America Real Estate ETF. Altogether, ISE has over 30 proprietary indexes, with some 20 exchange-traded products tracking those indexes. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, Chris, more than most people, really has a front-row seat to the incredible innovation occurring in ETFs. We're very pleased to have Chris joining us via phone from New York today. Chris, welcome to the ETF Store Show. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, Chris, my sense is that many of our listeners are probably unfamiliar with ISE and ISE ETF Ventures. Uh, You operate somewhat in the background. I guess to start here today, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, the company, and maybe how ISE became involved in ETFs? Yeah, sure. I I was an engineer by training and former life practice as an engineer, went to school for it from high school all the way through college. But my passion was certainly in trading. And I recall when I was very young, my, my dad loved to invest in pink sheet stocks, so the riskiest of the risky stocks. And I would help him track those stock prices. He would bring home the book back then. There was nothing computerized, and everything was printed on pink sheets of paper. So that's why they called them pink sheets. And, indeed, I would look those up and track the stocks, and that's how I first got my, my taste of it. And over the years, eventually uh, was old enough to start my first account, which was a dial-up modem account, and you had to make sure you didn't hit the, the send button too many times because you would buy or sell that many times. So those were the early days of trading. Over the years of engineering, that's where my passion really really was. And so I decided to make a big leap and left engineering and joined finance. And I guess you could say it's because of the, the engineering aspect of it that I still enjoy, where instead of building things for people, whether they're driving or using them or riding on them, and take in the case of uh, engineering and civil engineering, in this case it's more financial engineering, I guess you could say, and we're now developing products that our people are using and benefiting from every day. I joined ISE in 2002, and back then it was a virtually still a startup focusing on equity options, options on individual stocks. So ISE is an exchange operator. ISE now operates three options exchanges, but at that time the focus was to expand the number and types of listings on the exchange. So we thought about what was highly adjacent to the equity option space and thought about equity indexes and creating our own, and we started to do just that. We started to create indexes that focused purely on natural gas suppliers. Uh, We focused on water companies. We focused on even a syndex, alcohol, tobacco, and gaming stocks. But the index that you mentioned, and the one that's had a lot of success for us, thankfully, and I knock on wood every time we discuss it, is the cybersecurity index. And, and that I always use as a great example of the evolution of, of an ETF, but that was one that was a homegrown index, and we launched that, I think, just at the right time, and, and thankfully very successful for us. So now ISE, still an exchange operator, as you mentioned, still also provides not only the underlying indexes, but also financing and marketing support to launch new products as well. We have a lot of fun coming up with new ideas, but it is also a lot of work. 
Well, Chris, it's interesting. We've covered easily hundreds of ETFs on this show, and usually the focus is on the end product, the ETFs themselves and how investors might use them in their portfolios. But obviously you're involved more in the development of ETFs. You help take ETFs all the way from idea stage to the finished product and perhaps even beyond that in terms of marketing support. Can you maybe walk us through the process of how a new ETF comes to market? How does an ETF like the Pure Fund Cybersecurity ETF come to be? Sure. I mean, it, it, uh, it really is a journey, and sometimes the, an index will take a lot of different, different roads until it first becomes commercialized. The cybersecurity uh, index originally started as a homeland security index, where cyber was one of the components within it. And we launched that well over 10 years ago, but um, didn't get much traction as a derivative product or as an ETF. Perhaps it was before all of the headlines of, of hack attacks and, and uh, cyber events, so we noticed that over the, the subsequent years that that news was starting to uh, grow and, and hacking was unfortunately becoming more prominent in the news. And so we decided to focus specifically on that one, launch the index in late 2014 with the goal of creating an ETF. And the way we do it is we line up all of the partners associated with making sure the ETF is run on a day-to-day -day basis, since we are not doing it ourselves. So we talk to firms that are the advisor or the ones that are managing the portfolio or the ones that are helping on the marketing side. And we put it all together uh, as a venture firm, you could say, within the ETF space and then help launch the product and also help promote it subsequent to, subsequent to its launch. Chris, in your mind, what makes for a good ETF? What types of ideas does ISC uh, typically like to support? Well, you know, it's sometimes I feel like uh, there are so many different ideas that have yet to be developed, and it, it, it's very exciting, but it really starts with solving a problem in the industry. I think that's the best idea. If there's a problem in the industry, if it's an access problem, a convenience problem, if um, uh, somebody just doesn't have exposure to a certain asset class, problems to me are opportunities. And if we could solve the problem by way of a new ETF, whether that's a package strategy or, as I mentioned, providing convenience to a specific strategy in one ticker or access to a, a specific foreign market that investors wouldn't otherwise be able to get on their own, that's worth something to people. And that's what we look for. If we're solving a problem in the industry and, and it can be done by way of an ETF, for us, that we think gives it the best chances for success. Chris, this is Jason Lank. Uh, I'm curious, are there any concepts or ideas that didn't work as an ETF, that, that for whatever reason um, didn't make it to market? Maybe talk about some of the reasons why that might happen. Yeah, so yes, there are some ideas that don't make it to market. Sometimes it's based on just unfortunate timing. And if we have an idea in the market and we think that it's dependent on certain market conditions, and those market conditions deteriorate or they change abruptly, then unfortunately that concept will still remain in the pipeline and likely deprioritized. There are ones that, um, that do come to market, and let's face it, not, um, we don't have a crystal ball. We do, of course, look at news. We look at what's going on in the industry. We look at competitive gaps in the, um, uh, in, in the product layout. And we think we pick what are topical, important ideas. Nevertheless, some of them may not resonate strongly with investors, and, and therefore we have, to, we have to make some changes, making some changes either to the, directly to the index structure or even perhaps uh, delisting the, the ETF at some point, because in the end, it's really all about the investor, and we don't want people to suffer a product that's really not, um, not helping them in their portfolio. Again, we're visiting with Chris Monaco, head of ISE ETF Ventures. Chris, a big part of what your firm does is to help promote and market ETFs. And in the mutual fund world, brokers receive commissions for pushing certain mutual funds. In other words, mutual fund companies will pay for shelf space and brokers are financially incentivized to sell certain mutual funds. But ETFs don't pay commissions to brokers. So I'm curious, from a marketing perspective, how do you help ensure ETFs get a fair shake? Well, it's very, it's very difficult. There's a lot of ETFs out there, and, and I think every one of them should have their chance. And so uh, the goal for us is to make sure that people know that the product is out there. It's an awareness issue. And I think there's a lot of great media sites, as shows like yours, that highlight great new products. I think that's a big part of it. But what we do is we focus on the underlying concept 
Uh, we, we talk about where we think this fits in a virtual portfolio. Uh, we have our marketing team and wholesalers. You know, these are registered salespeople that go out and actively promote the product, talk to professional investors about where the particular product fits in a portfolio. But it's also leveraging the existing news that's going on when people read about hacking events and cybersecurity attacks, where people hear about drones and how drone technology is increasing or video game technology. These are the things that we look for, and we actually leverage to make sure that people are aware that, you know what, there's a very specific, well-thought-out, well-researched solution to getting exposure to that particular space. Chris, you mentioned that you pay attention to the news. Uh, what has been in the news as well recently is the new Department of Labor ruling regarding putting client interests first for investment advisors. And there's certainly a lot of discussion and debate about that. How does that type of ruling affect the ETF space, in your opinion, and your firm in particular? Well, I think um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot in there, but I think the, the net of it all will be positive for the ETF industry. I think that with the rise of, uh, of many fee-based advisors, that there is no potential for conflict of interest because there's no compensation from the, directly from the, the issuer in terms of a, what's called a 12B1 or a marketing fee. And because of that structure, I think it'll increase usage across different distribution channels, meaning that firms that were once predominantly uh, commission-based may switch to being fee-based. That just may be a natural course of action considering the changes from a regulatory perspective. But it also it makes sense for a lot of investors to have that type of relationship where with their advisor, where the advisor is purely being compensated on the amount of assets that the client is bringing to them rather than the product that they're, that, uh, that's being pitched through them. Chris, going back to ETF innovation, we've talked a lot on this program about how ETFs have certainly helped to democratize investing. They, they've given investors access to markets and strategies they simply couldn't have dreamed of accessing uh, even just a few short years ago. And, of course, ETFs can offer benefits like lower costs and tax efficiency and transparency. But we've also talked about how this innovation can be a bit of a double-edged sword because there are a lot of niche ETFs and, and some more complex ETFs on the market. Uh, how, how do you view this? Well, you know, this is a great question, and I, and I love talking about it because I look at some older statistics of the mutual fund industry, and if you were to ask someone in the mid-1990s when there were about 4,000 mutual funds, how many more could there be? I think if you told them there would be double that amount in 10 years, that person would think you're crazy. Yet here we are, and there's over 8,000 mutual funds. Not that they're all doing incredibly well. Of course, there are many of them that are not, but it's all about letting the marketplace decide what's important to them. Now, of course, there's an effort that goes with marketing the actual product, but in the end, I think there could be potentially thousands of more ETFs out there. The marketplace will decide which one's important, which ones aren't. And, and I think, you know, I also think about uh, an, an old saying, I'm not sure if it's attributable to someone that worked at the U.S. Patent Office at the turn of the, the last century, that said anything that can be invented has been invented. And it's certainly not the case, and you could see it with new ETFs launching almost every day. Chris, one of the intellectual debates we have at our shop revolves around the, the ETF strategy of any individual ETF. And one line of thinking might be one of the reasons it might outperform is that this concept is hard to implement and maybe not transparent. Well, we know ETFs have changed that. We now have a variety of strategies available for a nominal trade ticket. Is there any concern in the industry that once a concept is packaged and put in a box, that the outperformance might disappear? Well, you can never guarantee performance, as we all know, but there are certain strategies that can be codified in the form of an index, and I think that's the beauty of the ETF. The beauty of the ETF is that I feel that anybody that says they're an active manager, even if they say that, they're really following a set of rules that can be customized to become eventually an index. And so I feel that, that a lot of these, these concepts and strategies are very well thought out, and even though they can't uh, guarantee future performance, somebody can read them, somebody could read an index methodology, read the prospectus, and understand exactly what this index is supposed to do. Some of them are more complex than others, I agree, but the information is there for investors to read, and they can get exposure to strategies that would otherwise either be out of their reach because they may not have an account that enables them to trade derivatives, or it's a convenience issue. Why trade a multi-legged uh, derivative strategy if you can buy it as just XYZ? 
uh, ETF. And I think that's really the, the important part there. It's reducing costs, it's reducing complexity, and it's enabling exposure and access to areas where investors didn't have that before. Again, we're visiting with Chris Monaco, head of ISE ETF Ventures. Uh, Chris, you mentioned, uh, obviously, making sure the end investor understands the indexes uh, that the ETF tracks. Are, are there other aspects of ETFs that you think the industry, uh, which obviously includes both of us, uh, needs to do a better job of educating investors on? Well, I think the as much as the the information's there, I mean, it's certainly in very heavy documents. A prospectus can be light; it could be hundreds of pages, and an index methodology could be very complex as well. Some of the things that I think about, and I think will eventually happen, will be to come up with you could say the equivalent of the nutrition facts label on on an ETF. There are some high level statistics that I think would benefit people that, if standardized correctly. People can eventually do a deeper dive into the product, but it enables them to figure out exactly what this product is holding at any given time according to standardized uh, statistics. And I think that will grow, that will happen, and I think um, uh, you'll, you'll eventually see that a lot of them will be intuitive. They make a lot of sense. And even though it's out there, it's not consolidated in one easy-to-read, one-page document. I think that will be coming. As you look out over the next several years, where do you see ETF innovation occurring? Are there certain areas or segments of the market that you think are prime for new ETFs? I do. I mean, I'm, I'm very bullish on the industry overall. I think that um, whenever you have a flexible wrapper like this, again, it's going to provide people, any investor, uh, any access they want across the planet. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in how people can have access to commodity prices. Eventually, people will want to diversify their portfolios to other asset classes outside of equities. They're doing so now, and I think they'll do, they'll do that in a way where it doesn't uh, become completely dependent on futures uh, contracts, for example. And so I think they'll see more products that will be based on, uh, on potentially on physical commodities, on commodities that um, uh, are growing commodities of importance, maybe not in the U.S., but also overseas. I think we'll see more package strategies, so more sophisticated investors that are using options or futures in their portfolio but want a customized, streamlined way of doing it may opt to do that as an ETF that, again, provides that exposure for them in one ticker. I think we'll also see some folks that uh, may not be using derivatives but like the fact that they're getting a diversified portfolio, again, in that one ticker, and it may be a mix of bonds and equities and commodities and, and currencies within that ticker. And it's a one-ticker solution for people that, that, you know, they're just starting out, they're just beginning to save, and they want a smart portfolio. They're not looking for something to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we'll see more products like that as well. Chris, ISC really appears to be in the sweet spot of this growth and innovation in our industry. And certainly the new Department of Labor ruling is probably a tailwind as well. Is there any, with all of the good news out there, is there anything that keeps you up at night? Is there anything that your firm says, these are clouds out there that might impact us someday? Well, I think um, the, the, the biggest things that keep me up at night are the new ideas I have in my head that I want to build out. <laughs> <Right. Those> are, <laughs> but, yeah, there are, there are some, some things. I always think about liquidity. I think of market structure. Uh, how ETFs are being traded. There's great market-making firms out there now. I think um, there, there needs to be more discussion on market microstructure side between exchanges and market participants. That's happening now as we speak. I think that's, uh, that's one area that could use some improvement, but I'm, I'm happy to say that it appears that it's, it's already uh, ongoing. Chris, we have about two minutes left. You mentioned earlier, there, or earlier that there could potentially be thousands of more ETFs to come to market uh, where are we in the ETF growth cycle? Are we still early? Do you think ETFs are beginning to mature now? Uh, where are we? Well, it's, um, it, it's a mixed bag. I think overall, I hate to use the, the cliche, but we are in the early innings. I really do believe that. And I think there are some pockets of the ETF industry that are mature. Let's face it, there are over 60 products that are 10 basis points and, and cheaper in terms of expense ratio. And those are ones that are focusing on the areas that you would expect, whether it's just uh, plain vanilla, broad-based uh, domestic equity market exposure, small cap based on market cap. So that has matured quite 
a bit, and perhaps there's room for a product to go even lower. But once you get below 10 basis points, I think from an individual investor's point of view, there's not much cost savings between uh, the products. But I do, uh, I do feel like that there's potential for even those products where there's heavy pricing pressure across the issuers that are competing to have their products distributed in different channels, for example, in the 401k channel. But I also think there's a lot of opportunity for well-researched and even ones that require intensive research to have their, their time. And, and that's what we focus on. We, we like the heavy lift. We like the hard-to-structure and hard-to-research ideas because we think people are thinking about this and they want the convenience and the expertise associated with the underlying index and also the ETF. So I think we're really in the early stages, not only from a distribution point of view, but also from just a concept development point of view. Well, Chris, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Boy, just a wonderful discussion today. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, and we'd love to have you on the program again down the road. Uh, It's certainly an exciting time for both the industry and, more importantly, for investors. Uh, Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Always exciting. Hope to talk soon. That was Chris Monaco, head of ISE ETF Ventures. And if you go to ISE.com and click on the ETF Ventures tab, there's some great information there on the different ETF providers ISE works with and and how they work with them. Again, just go to ISE.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a quick market update, and we'll also spotlight an ETF tracking an ISE index. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Hi, this is Ryan Wiebe, owner of First Mortgage Solutions. If you've heard news lately about low interest rates and want to know if now is the time to buy a new home or even refinance the one you've got, Give one of my experienced loan consultants a call at 816-778-7000. If you're too busy to call right now, just go to firstmortgagekc.com and fill out a full online application. Last year, we saved our average refinance customer over $457 a month on their monthly bills. First Mortgage Solutions, 816-778-7000. The Weeby Group, LLC, Kansas License, MC002-50009, Equal Housing Lender. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of lawyers is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today.
Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Jason in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A strong week for stocks last week. The S&P 500 and Dow Jones Industrial Average were both up about one and three quarters percent. And the NASDAQ was up one and a half percent for the week. For the year, the S&P 500 is up nearly two and a half percent. The Dow is up three and a half percent. And the NASDAQ is still negative, but only by about three quarters of a percent. Jason, I thought we might briefly touch on oil this week. Uh, Oil continues to receive a lot of run in the media. Of course, over the weekend, 16 major oil-producing nations met in Qatar. This included 12 out of 13 OPEC producers and then a handful of non-OPEC producers, including Russia. And everyone was watching to see whether there would be a freeze in oil production to help support oil prices. Of course, oil has been in a, a real tailspin Over the past couple of years, though it has bounced back a little bit to start the year uh, this year, it's currently trading at about $40 a barrel. And there are several reasons investors are watching oil prices. But I think first and foremost is just the impact low oil prices have had on the U.S. energy sector. Uh, This sector uh, has been hit very hard. And then there's also been a spillover into the financial sector because many banks have made rather significant loans to the energy space. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this today. I don't want to make too much of this. I think sometimes the media runs with these oil headlines. We need to remember that falling oil prices can be a very good thing for consumers through lower gas prices. Uh, And that can also flow through to numerous other places since transportation costs uh, are a component of just about everything we buy. But on the other hand, falling oil prices are a concern for the energy and financial sectors. And that's why this has been getting so much play. Uh, Long story short, there is no agreement to freeze oil production at these meetings over the weekend. Uh, So for better or worse, oil is going to continue to be a major story. Uh, Whether that's ultimately positive or negative uh, remains to be seen. Oil is one of the most complex subjects that we can talk about because there are so many moving parts. It's not just about supply and demand. There are so many geopolitical events and strategies that come into play. You know, we might say it starts with Saudi Arabia. You know, they used to be called the swing producer, have billions and billions of, of untapped reserves still in the ground. One of the interesting things about Saudi Arabia is that nearly all of their revenues come from oil. And so the price of oil has a major impact on their budget, on their society, and of, of, of all the things that the government can do. And, of course, the headlines have been the conflict with Iran and, and the OPEC and the, and the oil producers unable to reach an agreement to you know slow down production. And the reason is that Iran remembers coming off sanctions for their nuclear activities. And so they're able to bring oil to market, and it's in absolutely the best interest to pump as much as they can. I mean, get all this oil out there, get as much revenue as they can and move along. Well, that impacts all the other producers. It, and notably, Nate, you mentioned that maybe one of the unstated goals of, of low oil prices and Saudi Arabian strategy is to put the high-cost producers out of business. And that's the shale industry in our, in, in, in our country, also the, the tar sands in Canada. But we will see echoes in, from the, the, the loans that will go bad and the infrastructure of, of energy in this country – is is really in flux right now. There's just a whole lot of brinksmanship going on worldwide that's causing you know the headlines and the traders to really have a just an amazing focus on this right now. Yeah, and you know, look on a on a day to day, month to month, even year to year basis, I don't know that the average investor should worry too much about what oil is doing. Uh, it does make for good headlines. I think personally that it's very interesting. You know, Saudi Arabia can can get oil out of the ground a lot cheaper than just about everybody else. And so that is their strategy. They're fine taking that pain in the short term with low oil prices to put the hurt on higher cost uh, producers. And, you know, that has uh, filtered over into the U.S. And so, you know, that's why this is in the news, because there has been, you know, really at the end of the day, carnage in the U.S. energy sector. I saw, uh, according to CNBC, the number of rigs in U.S. oil fields, listen to this, has fallen by nearly 80% from a peak of about 1,600 in October of 2014 to roughly 350 last week. Oil production has fallen by about 600,000 barrels per day from a peak of nearly 9.7 million last year. So 
there's no question OPEC's policies are having a significant impact on U.S. energy. Uh, and so, uh, again, for better or worse, the oil headlines are going to remain with us uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think, again, it's, it's, it's fine to follow these. I want to get too hung up on them on, on a day-to-day basis. But this will be very interesting to watch play out, uh, especially with what happens with Iran. Uh, so we'll certainly continue to talk about this on, uh, on the program. All right, let's take a, a quick break. And when we come back, we'll spotlight a cloud computing ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell branded products anywhere in the United States. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. The U.S. economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace, yet many Americans don't understand the parameters of this competition. Why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives? The simple answer is nobody ever taught them. The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy and Jason Lank in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,800 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the First Trust ISE Cloud Computing ETF. The ticker symbol on that is SKYY. Uh, Of course, we had Chris Monaco of ISE ETF Ventures on the program earlier, and this ETF tracks an ISE index, the appropriately named ISE Cloud Computing Index. Now, if you're not familiar with cloud computing, this is simply storing data or software 
outside of a computer. It's in the quote unquote cloud. And you can access this data and software through the internet. One of the biggest benefits of this is lower costs, especially to businesses, because you don't have to buy uh, those big servers or, or pay for IT staff. You simply access the data and software you need through the internet. Well, what the CTF seeks to do is track companies involved in the cloud computing industry. It holds 34 companies in all. These are hardware companies, uh, software companies, storage providers, service companies, and then other companies who generally support this space. Holdings are weighted based on the type of company. They're categorized into three broad buckets and then equally weighted. Uh, top holdings include companies like Alphabet, Facebook, uh, Oracle, and Cisco Systems. Again, 34 holdings in all. The expense ratio on this ETF is 0.6%. And Jason, this is currently the only ETF focused specifically on cloud computing. What I found interesting about this ETF is, you know, where does the, why cloud? How did that come to be? Well, that actually was used in flow charts and diagrams, if you remember how those work. And now they're all online or they're all computerized. But in the old days, we would use a, a ruler and make a flow chart. And we call those clouds. It goes all the way back to the 60s. But, you know, you've heard the question, where is the Internet? Well, that's increasingly where cloud computing comes in. And they're, they're server farms. So if you use internet-based email, a Gmail account or Google, or there's, there's, there's a variety of, of other ones, that's held somewhere. If you use Facebook and you upload pictures and videos, where do you think those are held? It's not on Mark Zuckerberg's computer. It's on a huge server. Streaming movies, if you're on Netflix and, and Amazon Prime and all the others where you can, where you can watch movies uh, in real time, where is that held? Well, these data farms are interesting, just small cities of servers, just huge computers. And think about the, the infrastructure and, the, and, the, and the, the type of communication network that has to be set up to handle all of this data moving around. Computers get hot. These have to be cooled specifically to a cooler temperature so that they don't burn up. And so there's tremendous energy usage. And so you actually tend to see these server farms built near cheap sources of power, hydroelectric, solar. So there are so many moving parts to these server farms, but at the end of the day, think how simple they make our lives. We don't have to have huge computer banks in our home anymore. They can be centralized and we can have anything we want on demand from the cloud. Well, I think about just our business, you know, I think about all the investment research and the analytics and everything we do that we're able to access, you know, a lot of that data and, and, and storage through the cloud. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. And, you know, here you have an ETF that would allow you to you potentially capitalize on that on that growing space. Uh, again, the ETF is the first trust ISE cloud computing ETF, ticker SKYY. And again, this tracks an ISE index. And Jason, we have just a, a few minutes left here on the show. Uh, you know, going back to our, our conversation with Chris Monaco earlier, ISE does sit in a very unique position. You, you know, the CTF we just spotlight again, they're providing the index on. But, you know, let me let me rattle through a couple of the ETFs that I mentioned earlier in the show that ISE is involved with. And just just listen to these pure funds, drone economy strategy ETF. OK, so, so tracking the, the up and coming drone space, the Blue Star Israel technology ETF. You know, people may be surprised. Uh, with, with the technology that Israel provides uh, really around the globe. The Lone Car Cancer Immunotherapy ETF. You talk about innovation occurring in, in cancer treatment. You know, that's really the, the immunotherapy treatment's really at the forefront of that. Uh, the Pure Fund Cybersecurity ETF. We all know how big of a, a part cybersecurity has uh, become of our lives. Last week, we spotlighted the Tierra Latin America Real Estate ETF. Allows you to get exposure to to REITs and real estate operating companies in, in Brazil and Mexico. The alternative uh, alpha ETF from Alpha Cloud, where it, you know uniquely selects holdings based on on 13F filings, and then has a dynamic hedge in place uh, to perhaps uh, you know prevent a large drawdown on that portfolio. You know, my point is, you just look at somebody like ISE, who many investors may not be familiar with, and you look at the types of products that they're involved with in the ETF space. And now every investor, everybody listening to the show, if you so choose, you have access to invest in these things. And to, to me, it's just remarkable. I, it's, I think it's very exciting. We've been really talking about the overriding theme on, on today's show has been about innovation and firms involved with it and ETFs that are the product of it. But in this particular, this cloud computing ETF, think of the transformational change that these companies are bringing about. You don't have to have 
an enormous computer in your office to store the data that you are going to use each day. You can, in many cases, and many companies have, have transformed to where you know their employees have a tablet or a smartphone or maybe a laptop, and that's all they need because the need to store data locally has gone away. And so that's changed how computer manufacturers operate, how companies operate, and certainly this cloud computing is is right there. So this is an interesting one. Yeah, and you can get exposure to it through an ETF. Absolutely. Uh, you know, as Chris said, uh, at the end of our interview, he believes we are still in the early innings of ETF growth, and, and we would certainly have to agree with him. Uh, we will have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. I again want to thank ISE's Chris Monaco for joining us on the program. Don't forget, you can listen to all of our guest interviews by visiting our ETF expert corner at ETFstore.com. All the interviews are, are listed right uh, right there on the page. You can listen to those interviews from a mobile device, from your iPad. Uh, full podcasts of the ETF Store show are also available at ETFstore.com, iTunes, and now Google Play. Uh, check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Next week, Jay Jacobs, Director of Research at Global X, will join us to talk multi-factor investing in smart beta ETF. Should be a great conversation. Until then, have a great week, everyone.